This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. Is it possible that we are currently living inside a video game that the future you designed, can you give hints as to how one would escape if this was a video game? How can a video game character escape to outside the video game? Are these things you don't consider when you design the game? Actually, we do. Because in the kind of games that we make, we want it to be as open as possible. So... You know, when you start a game, you're always testing. Stuck in a video game, you would you would try everything, and usually you're going to find a door or a space where the designers didn't uh, anticipate you piling all those crates up and getting over a wall that they didn't expect. Right, so it's not a designed doorway out. It's a... Uh accidental unintended doorway out and it's a it's a happy and as we do it we learn they're gonna find a way so just don't try to pen them in usually we leave like this developer test cell yeah area in the game that we don't anticipate anyone will find and and they ultimately find it it usually has crates of all the weapons in the game and things like that (laughs) the little hints you drop now will just drive people mad which is something i enjoy deeply uh so skyrim npcs have at times hilarious dialogue what does it take to build a good npc dialogue the main thing is to make them reactive A lot of times when you write characters for movies or things like that, you want to make that character interesting for themselves, right? What's their story? And there's some characters like that that the player definitely cares about. But the best characters are the ones that react to you. Mm -hmm. So you'll find a lot of people love our guards. And the guards are... or the way they react to something that you do. Lydia in Skyrim, who everybody loves, I'm sworn to carry your burdens, that's a generic line that all of the you know house carls have. And it just kind of lands when she says it. Why does it land? What do you, what do you, do you, and did you anticipate it would land? There's a slight snarkiness in that particular read of it. And you're asking her to do something and she's reacting to you. What about the the trade-off between maybe the randomness? It's a very small, think of it as a small state machine that just says, okay, this is what's happening. Here's a random list of things I could say to that. And then some of that um, plays out in ways you don't anticipate. But we look at the things. What are the players doing that we could have the characters respond to that they don't expect? You know, jumping on tables or stealing stuff or, um, you know, sneaking in in the middle of the night or those kind of things. The more that we can do, the more reactive and interesting the characters appear. And these state machines, how big are these things? Are these individual to the individual characters? It's just fascinating how you design state machines. Is it just a, just a giant you would, I would think of the AI as one big one. Yeah. Oh, so... For, okay. for sort of everybody. So there's an AI... There's That's a manager just, for all the people. Yeah. And one of the <laughs> things people that... people manager. Right, manager. right. Nice. One of the things that makes what we do particularly unique is a 
in the world without you. So there is a feeling to role playing games that you're the central, you're at the center of the world and the whole world rotates around you as it does in normal life. Like when we walk around, right. it, there's a, when you forget yourself, you start to take yourself very seriously. Like you are the center of the world. Uh, you forget that there's 8 billion people on earth and you forget that they have lives. That's actually a sobering realization that they all have really interesting life stories and they have their worries. They suffer in different complicated ways. And yet when you play a role playing game, there's a, I mean, both computationally and from a storytelling perspective, you wonder if the world goes on without you. Like if you come back, if you take a break and you come back, is there still a bustling t town that now has a history since you have last visited? So to what degree can you create a world that goes on without you or goes on at the same time as you do your thing, whatever the heck you're doing? We don't prioritize the stuff you can't see. So it's more like an amusement park. If you study like the design, our level designers did this, how do they build Disney World in these places? So it still exists for you, the player. So it is fairly, you know, when you're going to come in, this is what you're going to see. The shops are in the front. You're going to do this. It's just for us to make it far more believable and get some more emergent behavior that not just make that sort of the verisimilitude of what you're in for that moment, but you you buy it all. Mm -hmm. I always say like, you know, we got to do the little things so that you buy the reality. Out of the wasteland or those kind of things that you, it has the impact to you as the viewer that it would to the people in the world. some of this, but even more so in the future to say, how do these things exist? Take like a faction in the world. What is their role in the world as opposed to just their role is for the player to join it, go through a bunch of quests and become the head of the faction. You know, think a little bit deeper about the simulation and what would the Mages Guild be doing in a fantasy world or the Fighters Guild be doing in a fantasy world versus just sign up, do quests, get gold. And so that when you show up to that mage's guild, it's a bustling guild full of stuff going on. It's not just that it's bustling, it's that they feel rooted in it. They don't feel like a storefront for come here, do quests, get experience. Is that one of the essential components of randomly generated worlds? So when I think back to Daggerfall, as gigantic world when i first played it i thought like i mean you're just struck by the 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 immensity of it right the the immensity of the possibility constraints and daggerfall actually was a touchstone for us going into starfield for how we do the planets because there is, there's a different kind of gameplay experience when you just wander out. Different than we've done before and fun in a different kind of way. We'll talk about Starfield. So uh, just for people who don't know and how dare you for not knowing, <laughs> but uh, we're, with Daggerfall, we're talking about the Elder Scrolls series that started uh, so talking about the big titles within the series, started with Arena in 94, Daggerfall in 96. I didn't look up the years before this. This is depressing or or, or awesome. Um, uh, so all of these games brought hundreds, probably for some of them, thousands of hours of joy for me. So Arena, Daggerfall, Morrowind, Oblivion, uh, and Skyrim. <laughs> number of villages and places that Daggerfall has while Daggerfall focuses on the Iliac Bay area. Arena does it all. It just changes. 
was so cool to have the just the role playing game aspect. You're focused on the items and the character development. You Daggerfall has a lot more depth, particularly in the character system. That's what it introduces all of the skills and those kind of things. Arena is actually it's a game I love, um, and it's very very elegant. If you look at the first one, where it's just an X- XP based system. Do this, get XP, level up. Very classic role-playing game. Um, Daggerfall digs deep into who's your character, how you're going to develop it, what are your skills, there's advantages, there's disadvantages. And the environment going full 3D from Arena, which is actually like a two and a half d Doom-style engine, um, that I, I agree with you that Daggerfall feels like there's more possibilities uh, when you're playing it. Were you able to like look up to the sky in Daggerfall? Yep. My, yep. my yeah, memory is. Yeah. It's, so that's what full 3D means. And then you can go outside the city. You can walk outside the city. You can do that in Arena too, but it, it looks more fakey, right? It's all going to be a flat plane. Here comes things. And then a dungeon entrance is a, you know, 8 bit. Here comes a little a flat coming at the camera. So before we go to the end uh, and the middle, so from Starfields of fallout and the elder scroll series let's go to the very beginning what's the origin story you know what let's even go before then what's uh when's the first time you, you remember the thing that made you fall in love with video games at the time had a song had a cartoon had all of the things um nintendo comes along so it was always part of you know i think if you were a kid growing up then it was such a newness to playing things like that. I remember being in fifth grade when the TRS-80 was brought into the classroom and there was a Star Trek game. And I was enamored with it. And they were going to start teaching some rudimentary programming. Like, okay, would you like to know how this is made? And I was was hooked. It's like, I need to figure out how to make this stuff. And so I was a you know self-taught programmer, and my whole goal was to write my own video games. And uh, you know, by sixth, seventh grade, I had written my own much better Star Trek clone for the yeah, of Apple II. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed programming on the Apple II then, and that I think was the right level of like complexity you know, at that age where you could kind of, you were always learning, but you could still understand a lot of the problem set for like, this is what I want to get on the screen. And I was also into art. So I did a lot of art and I did a lot of programming and I was always making games. That was my hobby from the time I was, you know, 10 or 12. What was to you involved in making games? Like, how did you think of it? Was it from a graphics perspective, like what shows up on screen? Was it how it makes you feel? Was it about the story? Was it the text-based stuff and the dialogue and the prompting? Like what, what, like, um, what does it mean to create a video game at that young age to, to you? Well, it was. And then I loved the games, the wizardry and Ultima that were able to bring that to a computer so I could, you know, do it on my own time. It was very, very real to me. I'd sit in my bedroom and then go to bed and think about it. And then, oh no, I have to go to school. I want to come home and figure out how to, how to do this problem in the game. And so whatever I was creating was something that I was excited about at the time. I made a Raiders of the Lost Ark game. Um, Like with graphics and everything? Yeah, I was, so it was usually, you know, made a Miami Vice game, made a Gru the Wanderer (laughs) game, made a Traveler game. I may, and but every time I was doing it, I wanted to figure out a new method on the Apple II of pulling it off graphically. Whether that was editing character sets to get graphics in different formats, or how can I enable the secret double high res mode it had, or just things like that, where it became kind of this limitless. What can I make this do? And I had some friends who were doing the same thing. And then you get into who can impress each other. And I was kind of middle of the pack, I would say. Um, 
And then, but, but again, this was the time where they're bringing computers into the school and the apples come into the school and the teachers are learning it because they have to teach the students. But then I was, I would say I was part of a group of students that were like way past that. Um, and it was very much of a self-taught, uh, you know, how, how do you make this thing dance? I'd like to ask a strange question. So at that time, a lot of people consider you one of, if not the greatest game designer creator of all time. You were middle of the pack then. Uh, did you have a sense that this would be your life and you would also be creating, you know, the greatest games ever? Not, not in the slightest. Um, no, I don't think anybody, but I was very much like that was my dream at a, at that age, but you don't think that that's a job, you know, and the, as I got older, I was really going through business degree and then interviewing for some jobs, like finance jobs. So, well, I guess I should do this to make money and I can keep doing this on the side. And I remember I actually got to like the final level of like this corporate finance job at Circuit City. Mm -hmm. Nice. And they turned me down. And I was like, fuck them. I'm just going to go make video games. <laughs> so thank yeah. you, Circuit City. <laughs> yeah, I remember Circuit City. I think they went bankrupt, actually. Well, they were based in Richmond. I was going to school close yeah. to there. And so. So what, what's the origin story of you joining uh, Bethesda Softworks at the time? So. Was, you know, in. Rockville, Maryland. And, oh, that's on my way home over Christmas break back to William & Mary, where I went to college. And, and I was at this point committed, like, this is what I want to do. So I'm just going to drive by and knock on the door, which is what I did. So I, I drove by and knocked on the doors, Martin Luther King Day, 93. And someone came out and met me and said, well, maybe, what, and I said, well, I'm, I'm in college. I'm talking about when I'm out of school. I'm like, well, okay, well, contact us then. And I will say I was, I was, I would contact them every once in a while. I did work for a small software company right um, out of school uh, down in that area of Williamsburg and still would contact Bethesda. Arena had just come out. Mm -hmm. So then we're in 94, Arena had just come out, and I loved it. So I was into sports games. I like the hockey stuff. They were doing a basketball, they did a basketball game. Yeah, I'm just looking at, they did a lot of, they did like six sports games, six. But that's the, the released Iron. 10 games, yeah. six of them sports games, and NCAA basketball, hockey league si simulator. Hockey league simulator, yeah. So it was really like sports gridiron, which is like the first kind of physics-based football game at the time. Um, and there's a famous story with Electronic Arts trying to do Madden and then hiring Bethesda before my time to make Madden because they were struggling. Um, and when I started at Bethesda, I remember the owner had John Madden's... O o It had just come out, and they were doing the CD-ROM version. So CD-ROMs aren't even out yet. Um, oh, it used to be floppy disks. That's probably one of what was the we would release? burn them in the basement. We had the disk replicators. Right. So Arena was not released on floppy. It was. It was. On... Yeah. It's. I believe it's six floppy disks. Six floppy disks. <laughs> Maybe it was eight. Yeah. But in those days, the number of floppy disks was very, very important to what the money you were making. So, you know, if you want to do a big, huge game, like, well, that's just too many disks. So the CD-ROM became this, this jumping off point for the whole industry where, oh, it's unlimited data. By the way, I played Arena... Uh... So that that was, uh, of course, attained um, <laughs> legally, as one does. Alternate means? 
by alternate means right uh on floppy on floppy disks and that was um that was such an incredible as 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 you as you probably have seen interacted with a large number of people it's a, it's a whole world it's a world that you escape to in the way like uh, your favorite book like lord of the rings you it was just some it was um it was unlike anything else it was incredible. It's probably, I mean, of course, as people say, it's the, the first game you play is the most, uh, is the one that really sentimentally means the, the most to you. That was, I think, the first role-playing game I played, and it was just changed everything. Was Arena? It was Arena, yeah. I, I think D Daggerfall is what I really kind of really played, um, especially because, it, like you, you said, the character development was really rich, but just like that you can uh, be feel like you travel to this whole other world that's less about entertainment like a shooting game right and more about a world it felt like it's a world like like uh like you're literally there you can travel there you can live there you actually feel like that person versus like a pac-man like um like an arcade fun entertaining advent adventure game so uh so you joined, you made it. <laughs> uh, what did you work on first there? I worked, well, we, everyone did a bunch of stuff. So I worked on the basketball game, really just to get it out the door. And F Terminator Future Shock. So we were doing Future Shock and Daggerfall at the same time. They were developing a new engine. So it was one of the first 3D engines, the X engine. There were um, there were a bunch of guys from Denmark, actually. It was like a, there was like a big Danish demo scene in those days in the PC. And so a bunch of the top programmers there. Well, look, this is not big. This is not a big company. Maybe there's 20 people in development. Um, and we were doing both Daggerfall and the new Terminator. And so... Daggerfall was a bit more, again, behind the Terminator game. So I was one of the main people on the Terminator team. Oh, legally? So there was no one to tell us what to, like, no, you can't do that. So we would, you know, pick apart the movies and, oh, how does he mention the gun he wants and the wattage of the laser and all these things. And so... Future Shock is a game that I still love today. It does a lot of things that if you go back and look at it, we're frankly still doing. Like it's a large open world post-apocalyptic, you know, landscape height map with instanced objects all over it. And that is still a lot of how we build our worlds. What's an instanced object? It's, you know, some games, every, uh, you know, wall or building is kind of unique in its data, whereas we would just build, you know, these little husks of buildings and then place them all over the place. So the memory and the way you render it is much more optimal. So that allows you to build a bigger world. The more allows you some new method or some new game system. And it was every year that innovation, 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 and then, you know, 3D acceleration comes along. And then these things come along, and then HD comes along. And it is true that as time goes on, there is visually a diminishing return in terms of what you're able to do on the screen. And it there's a ton of work that goes into it now because just rendering this cup to the perfect shine and material and roughness and how does the global illumination off this wall, like it's a ton of work. Yeah. Um, but you can pretty much do what you want now if you want to put the time in. Whereas then, okay, you, can, you can't do everything you want. So pick your battles really carefully and it, technically you couldn't do what you want, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. How much trade-off is there now in uh, how much effort you put into the, the the realism of the graphics versus the story? And actually, not even how much effort you put in. But 
writers and programmers. It's usually where we find as time goes on, the amount of art time that it takes to create a cup compared to what it used to be, that has increased. So we do use, like most people use, you know, art outsourcing as well so that we're not, we still relatively compared to our industry and what we're doing, have smaller teams. What about the experience of the beauty of the graphics? So like um, one of the most amazing things about Skyrim, and maybe you could say that about some of the other games, but for me, Skyrim is the outdoor, when you step outside, yeah. it's the outdoor scenery. So what does it take to create the feeling, especially of that, being outdoors of nature and just like <laughs> lost in the beauty, whatever it is when you go hiking and you feel the awe of it, how do you create that awe? Is that graphics? What is that? It's a lot of graphics. It's a lot of mood. We just like, talk about it in terms of tone. Mm -hmm. And those are, again, going back to my previous comment, the graphics are very, very important to us because, and, and we always push them, because when you're doing the kind of things we do where you step into a virtual world, it does have to have that moment of, wow, this, is, this feels real. I've never experienced this. And it's okay, I think it's okay to let just like the time settle. Meaning you step out, just how does the wind sound? How are the trees moving? How are the clouds moving? Um, I enjoy strolling and watching the sunset. You know, how does it land over the water? Like it doesn't have to be like, hey, let's go, let's finish a quest, let's go kill things, let's figure out the next step, let's level up. Like, I like the quiet moments a lot. And I think you, when you play our games, you can tell we spend a lot of time on them. Um, then you watch like the weather roll in. Um, I think that's just part of being, being that character, being that person in that space. Just, and then answer questions and so on. That just feels, um, that's a completely stress-free environment. It's just, you are, just like you said, in this moment in time. And it's so incredible. It, it feels as incredible as going hiking or some, something like that, but in another, in a totally different place, like in, like uh, Iceland or something like that, mm -hmm. this, this, this whole other surreal, ethereal place. Um, yeah, it's incredible how you kind of create that. So graphics is a part of that, but also letting it, uh, the temporal aspect of that, like the wind, the the, the rustling so sound and look and all of that. The soundscape is really, really important. And the sky, we spend a lot of time on the sky because it's, it's taking up much more of the screen than a lot of people give credit for. What about the rendering, the openness of it? Like, how do you, is that? There's is that... a lot of level of detail, streaming work. And, uh, you know, nowadays it's getting more common. Like, frankly, the systems are built better for it. Skyrim and Oblivion and the fallouts of that 360 era. It's a, and it was a lot of time spent on how do we get all this data streaming in as you move and then levels of detail so you can see all the way, but not, you know, crush the processor. And you know what, let's even st step back, because you mentioned tone, you mentioned tone a lot. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by tone? It's all of it together. If you look at, I think you can flip through, let's just take fantasy. You know, you can sort of look at a couple images or things and know, how does Lord of the Rings different from Game of Thrones that is different than, um, you know, uh, a Thurian like Excalibur or your, you know, sci-fi channel, <laughs> uh, you know, series of the month kind of thing. Um, is grounded in 
reality for what it is and then have lesser kind of um, fantastical things, at least at the start. And then they, they kind of build. So even when we do Starfield, I mean, it's a science fiction game. There are laser guns and spaceships that fly around, shoot each other and blah, 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 blah. Is it for utility? Is it for decoration? How do they live their lives? Does this feel like a place that you believe that it has some grounding in our reality, whether that's historical or near future, or that it's grounded in some, some semblance of the reality that you and I understand so that it can feel, it's also making it feel a little bit welcoming. Like, okay, I understand this. Is that art or science? So like, what? how do you know when it feels welcoming and, and everything fits and is grounded? I don't know. I mean, it's, I guess it's personal taste. Some people like things that are weirder, that have more fantastical from the get-go. Even a game like Morrowind, where we get into some more fantastical things, it intentionally starts a little more grounded. You know, there's a very classic medieval looking town that you come into, but you look just beyond it and there are mushroom trees and giant insects and things like that. So in Skyrim, when you put a dragon in it, what are your thoughts about dragons and tone? How does that fit into tone? That's a great question. <laughs> the... <laughs> <laughs> it's a ridiculous question, but yeah, I just love no, dragons. Are, so I want to bring it up. No, no, no. <laughs> these are the things that Thank we you. we debate um, with. <laughs> Do we include a dragon? Why didn't you include a dragon in Daggerfall? That's what I want to know. I think there's dragon. There's dragonlings. They were hard to do. Dragons are hard to do. So when you start Skyrim, say, hey, look, you know, dragons are going to be a theme. You start, start visually. I think yeah, you know, they're. You know, you can make the argument that dragons existed. Okay, what would they look like? How close to dinosaurs would they be? Or what would they... And ours are less, I believe they're less fantastical looking in general. They look like beasts that could exist in that world. Um, and then how we introduce them, it's kind of a little bit of a slow, you know, role in Skyrim. And that the people in the world are reacting to the dragons appearing... And that's somewhat, you know, mirrors, you want something that mirrors the player experience as well. It says back to you, like, hey, no, these are, this is, have you heard this? Someone saw a dragon. Well, that's what Daggerfall, is there, isn't there mentions of dragons or something? Because I remember, I remember being sure that there's dragons in Daggerfall. As I'm Actually, there is a dragon here. Um, okay. but I'm pretty sure they're sort of, they're not. Yeah. And then game I did, Red Guard, which um, we bring back a dragon, it takes place beforehand, so we have a dragon there mm -hmm. in that game, and that was unique to that at the time. Yeah, uh, just a brief tangent on that. I thought Red Guard was a really, really good game. I played it. in the Elder Scrolls series to put it in, into that world, but it was like an adventure game. It reminded me of another game I really love, like Prince of Persia. That was the ins one of the inspirations. Prince, Prince of Persia is one of my favorite games. Like, I, mean, okay, if I, if I apologize if I'm forgetting, but you can like jump in buildings and stuff. Like there's a jumping, there's a dynamic, like airy nature. Like it's a like parkour yeah, that type was of situation. Um. Yeah, it was an incredible game. What? Why do you think? Let me ask sort of a, a dark question. Why do you think that game was a flop? One of the, one of the few. You Not recall. a dark question. Yeah, it was. Um, well, a lot of reasons. Um, game game that I love and really got us going on a handcrafted world. So we're coming off a of dagger. This predates Xbox. Right, where it's much more like constantly Tomb Raider had come out. So you see those influences of Tomb Raider on that game. And 3D effects cards had just come out. And so, okay, we can do... And it was the last, I think it's one of the last like DOS games in a Windows world. So it, I think it missed kind of a technology window as well as 
ultimately not what people wanted from us, you know? Um, and I felt I was really like they let me do this creative thing. It didn't do what we needed it to do. And now we're in a very, very bad situation. A uh, company almost went out of business. And that's when it got reformed with Zenimax Media and Robert Altman came in and we were starting more when we had just sort of started. And it was sort of that whole experience that made you sort of realize, someone says to you, okay, you're gonna get another shot. Mm. And that's where you're like, okay, we're gonna make Morrowind and make, the biggest best rpg we can make we know what the audience wants from us we know what we could do building a world so there's like callbacks to how we built the world in redguard morrowind is a large scale handcrafted but if you were to put it you know pixel per pixel with daggerfall you wouldn't even see morrowind like because mm -hmm. daggerfall is so big but the impact of playing it i think is in many ways equal but different just you personally, psychologically, did you have doubt about yourself from from the performance of Red Guard? Like, do I even do I know what it of is? Of course, to, of course. Where where do you get the? How do you overcome that? I, well, I don't know. I would say this honestly. I enjoy it so much. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I'm so we're make, I'm so heads down. Like that becomes for better or worse, like my life. Yeah. Um, and. It's just something that I want to play so much. It'd be kind of self-doubt about, do I know what it takes to create a great game? Well, no, I think Red Guard's a great game. All right, so you were sure, even if okay, it was Okay, so if you're going to debate, like, do I like that game? It's about finding an... Okay, so I love Red Guard. Yeah. And the people who play it, it, it won a bunch of awards, and, it, you know, it, like, critically was a pretty good game. Did not sell... And the reason for that, again, like we probably made this the wrong type of game and we missed a technology window. We also thought it was very conservative. Like we're going to do this. So my main takeaway was I'm not going to be conservative again. That long time ago during Red Guard, the lead programmer made me, made all the buildings hop up and down after you played for 10 minutes just to mess with me. Uh, just a, a, a curious tangent, What what's um, involved with programming an open world game? So we, we, so we talked about, we will talk about design and so on. Right, because they're gonna, they're gonna play the game for a very long time as well, which we've learned. And you can't go through and touch everything by hand per se. Mm -hmm. So you have to rely on some systemic level of creation and a lot of systems that are robust enough so that when they touch another one, things aren't breaking apart. So there's like a, what are the major systems? Is there like the physics of the game, the engine of how like stuff? Mm -hmm. data that I have. So a lot of people confuse engines with rendering. I mean, they're combined, obviously, but there's the data you're going to give to a renderer, which is the thing, you know, the audience, you know, that draws the pixels on the screen. So there's a, most of the engine is, is how are you going to bring of the physics and the interactivity? What are the things that are there just to be drawn? And what are the things there that are meant to be interacted with and touched? We put a big premium on the ones that can be interacted with and touched, whether it's flowers, whether the trees move, whether you can sleep on the sofa, sit in this chair, pick up all the stuff, bake bread, blah, blah, blah. You then have the AI, which loops in the stuff we talked about earlier in terms of processing everybody and combat systems which is a lot of what end of people end up doing, combat systems on top of that AI. How do they react to those types of things? And then how, how do they look at the things that can be interacted with? 
One of my favorite things is when NPCs will go pick up weapons in the world, which you don't see in other games. And the first time you see it in one of ours, it's like very unexpected. Mm -hmm. You can drop like a crazy weapon, be in a fight, and an NPC runs over, picks it up, and uses it on you. It's not something you would expect. Um, but I love that stuff. And that's integrated into a larger system, the ability to pick up a, the NPC picking up a So it's not like a little quirk that's hard-coded in. It's part of a bigger system. They they have their own AI for scanning the environment, and that's one of the rules. Hey, is there a weapon that is better than the one I have? I'm going to go get it. Now, we do lock off if it's in a chest, and that's treasure we left for the player. But it's in particular, because <laughs> what you don't want, we actually had this problem. It yeah. started in Oblivion, I believe, which is we set up a level. Hey, let the enemies go pick up the you know weapons if they're better. So we make a level and go in and... Wow. All of the enemies are armed to the teeth and there's no treasure for the player because the enemies went and took all the <laughs> good weapons. And he's like, yeah. okay, they don't take those. They take the ones that are dropped. Because in part, that experience is uh, defines the experience of the player. So how they interact with their environment defines how you, how the player experiences their environment. Is there a room for further and further development of the AI that controls the NPC? Sure, we're always iterating on it. And again, as we look in the future, it's more about us finding those more reactivity to the player and also understanding their roles in the world. So they're not just there. They're not just there for the player to, as a signpost mm -hmm. for the player. But they're reacting to the player. But what about, you know, some of the richest experiences we have with people is like the chaos of it, the pull, the push and pull, the unpre unpredictability. Is there something, I don't know if you've been following, but the, the, the quick, amazing development of language models, uh, the neural network, natural language processing systems, dialogue systems. Um, do you think there's some possibility of using sort of these incredible neural nets that can have open-ended dialogue, basically chatbots? Yep, I've seen some incredible demos. I do think it's coming. I don't know when. Yeah. Um, and there's a little bit of a question, like what's ready for real so there's still computational ch challenges like how do you actually make that happen right well what about oh in, in terms of creating the feeling of an npc uh, what's the role of voice actors and awesome yeah we we work with a ton of voice actors and they <laughs> No, sorry, that got cut. Do you ever uh, try to sort of imagine that people fall in love with the characters, with the NPCs? I do. Like, I mean, do they get really attached to the... Oh, oh yeah. I, I mean, mean, I've done like, it in games. These are like close friends, right? Like, you can... You're like, you miss them. A hundred percent. Isn't that part I of the actually, thing like, whenever I'm playing a game and there is, you know, if there's like a friendship option or make friends or a romance thing, I, I find those moments really, I enjoy them. I find them pretty impactful emotionally to what we're doing. And so um, we've done a little bit of it. It's one of the things that we actually have pushed in Starfield. So we have a number of companions, but for them, we go you know, I won't say super complex romantic, but but more complex relationships than we've had in terms of... You, and when you make him upset, you drift out of like it never happened. You know, you drift out of it, whereas we wanted one where, okay, we can be in a relationship and yeah. um, we've committed to each other in some way but I just did something that really made you angry. Yeah. And as opposed to just drifting out of that status, you're in a temporary, I don't like what you did state. Well, so some greater degree of complexity in the relationship with the companion. A little, a little bit. A little, a little bit. bit. A little bit. Are we I, don't talking about... I don't want to oversell that part, but sure. I, my point is, I think those things where you meet a character in a game 
and you do spend time with them, a companion in a game, and it leads to romance, you know, myself and others, and I find a lot of players, those moments are really, really impactful and special to them because they did put in the time. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that I always come at it with, which is, I think people who don't play video games, they sometimes think like, oh, that's, I don't know, that's a waste of time, or that's not real, or that's not like, you're not getting a lot out of that. Like, well, you haven't really experienced it in the way that you can, because these moments that I spent in games, not, not the ones I made, other ones when I was growing up or even now, those are that is important time to me. Mm -hmm. Like, I love those moments. I felt really, like, proud of what I accomplished. And... We want people to have that in our games. And the fact that they've ha they have had those experiences and we hear from them and how important it is to them, it's like, no, this is, this is really, really special. Yeah, it's, uh, it's fun. I mean, from a, from a game design perspective, I wonder if you can honor the time you spent together with the game. Because, um, you know, sometimes there's a heartbreak at the end of the game. Like when you're, mm. when you, when you leave a game, there's a, yeah, it's a really complicated relationship actually. Cause when, when you leave a game, it's almost like leaving a romantic partner because <laughs> it's like you spent so much meaningful time together and there's a sense in which it was, uh, it was ephemeral. Like you, right? This this is not this it didn't happen. Yeah, it didn't really happen. It was good. It was like you went to Vegas, and you got drunk and <laughs> stuff. But like, and now life goes on. I wonder if there's a way to sort of always carry that with you. I mean, I guess with words you can kind of share with others. Like it's the, weird. I don't like now that we're in the age where you have achievements and you can look at your library right. and see your hours and games. Like that's like, it's almost like a scrapbook now. Like I wish, one of my wishes was like, I wish I had that achievement list for everything. Like back to the late seventies. Right? Like every game you play. Right. When, yeah. yeah. Like the, you, <laughs> I mean, that's one of the cool. And I love this game. Starflight was one. Star Control 2 was a game that I loved. Um, Sundog was a big one in the Apple II days that a lot of people don't know that I loved. And so a lot of us in the studio felt it was time to do something new. You know, we're going between Elder Scrolls and Fallout and going back and forth. And I mean, we love that. But hey, we've always wanted to do this Explore the Galaxy science fiction game. You know, now is the time uh, to do that. And uh, that's a brave move. So Fallout is post-apocalyptic on a single planet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Elder Scrolls series is uh, on a single planet. So this is going out into the open world of many star systems, many planets. I saw that it's uh, thinking about a hundred star systems and a thousand planets available to explore. Um, what is that world of stars and planets like? Well, you mentioned Daggerfall. We go back to some of that. Well, the first one we did it was, how are we going to render a planet, like pull it off for the player? Like, can we? Or do we have to sort of do it where you can't land on all of them, where you're landing in a very controlled, small world space that we, you know, kind of craft and you would have a very limited set of those. Mm -hmm. You go back to tone, like, well, that's probably the wrong tone. And how can we say yes? Like, I want to land on that ice ball. So it started, we started the game right after Fallout 4, so 2016. And the first thing we did was, can, you know, how can we have a system to generate these planets and make them look, you know, I'll say reasonable, as opposed to, you know, fractally goop. Um, 
Well, yeah. what's, the, what's the technical definition of goop? <laughs> Fractally goop? I, Fractally yeah. goop. You've probably seen a lot of like simulations, whether they're space things or landscape things, where they're using fractals and just the landscape does not look real. It's just this is like highs and lows and it's muddy. And so we did find a way, we came up with a way, um, had prototyped of, of building tiles, like large tiles of landscape, the way we would usually build them. We kind of generate them offline, hand do some things, and end up with these very realistic looking tiles of landscape, and then built a system that wraps those around a planet mm -hmm. and blends them all together. And we had pretty successful results with that. And so we thought, yeah, we could, we could do this. Um, and so there was a big design kind of problem to solve in terms of, well, what's fun about landing on a planet where there's potentially nothing? Because there's a lot of planets and moons, if you kind of, right, in reality, that, well, there's nothing on them um, except resources. And so we spent a lot of time figuring out, okay, let's just lean in on that can A, be a lonely experience, as long as we tell the player, here's what's there, here are the resources that are there, go find them. But I equate it to that moment of, we said about listening to the wind go and watching the sunset. And I do think there's a certain beauty. And all of those things that you would expect, and it's, it's all really happening. And most people probably won't notice or appreciate all of that, but um, I think it gives them the ability to say, I want to go do that and see that on that place. As long as we tell them, hey, the quest leads over here. Here's where the handcrafted content is that you would expect. And then here's more of the open procedural planet experience. So you your Long answer. I don't know if I answered your question. I, there's no the, right. the questions are stupid and the <laughs> answers are brilliant. So that, that's how this works. So this is the world's most immense simulator of um, the human condition of loneliness. Because <laughs> I can't imagine a more lonely well, you mean, experience. I mean, of, you put it that way. I don't, just I don't know. That was the goal, but just on a planet alone. I just I, I, it, that must be. I mean. The, a deep embodiment of what loneliness is like. I mean, it's the um, both the awe and the, like when you hike alone. Mm. There's a there is a deep loneliness to that. It's like uh, it's humbling that this thing will last much longer than you. It's been here way before you. Is it the line from the moon landing? Beautiful desolation. It's Buzz Aldrin, is it? Beautiful desolation, is that I what think, you said? I think so. Beautiful desolation. Well. Something like that. But that's just words. There's a feeling to it. And you want that feeling to be real. You just hear, there's some resources here. I just feel like it will hit people at a certain moment. Like it does for me with Skyrim. Like, holy shit, I'm here alone. And, the, and whatever cruel nature that's out there doesn't really care about me. Exactly. <laughs> that's the that's, that's the experience. So you you want to create the whole planet, and you want to have many of them. We have, we do have many. But once you build that system, I think the numbers become. I mean, honestly, a little bit. We we wrap it in so we can name them all and and have a finite set, even though it's a very very large number, but a, a set that we can. a planet. I mean, a planet is sort of infinite space. We go back to the Daggerfall analogy, right? If you have systems to build that much space, doing a hundred planets or a thousand or 10,000 or a million planets is not, it's just, you just press, you just change the number <laughs> and press the button. But you can't, you can't name them all. You can't control like when you're getting in really big numbers. Hey, what is, what does the system way out here feel like if you take your ship and jump that far? We do level the systems. When you go to system, you'll see, oh, this is like a level 40 system. And us being able to at least control that scale is how we kind of ended up with the hundred-ish systems we have. What what are the what are the levelings? What what do you mean by level we level? It would be like level. when you look at a map in a game and says, This is the area. And 
evolved. And we've dialed it back as we've been making the game, whereas we used to run out of fuel. You jump and get stranded, which on paper was a great, like, it's a great moment when you get stranded and you have to press this beacon and you don't know who's going to come. Mm-hmm. Um, turns out that's not like, it just stops your game. We found, you'd be playing the game and I ran out of fuel. Okay, I guess I'll just wander these planets trying to mine for fuel so I can get back to what I was doing. Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, it's a fun killer. That's too realistic of a simulation of the human condition. Yeah, and the idea was, well, it's for, you know, games do that. If you had like a hardcore, <laughs> you're right, a hardcore survival mode, that's the yeah. kind of thing you would do. Maybe we'll do it in the future. Uh, that's more than uh, me in terms of... I'm offended right now. You're calling robots generic and you No, 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 the back. ones we use, the ones we, we use. We okay. made them more generic. We didn't... Sorry, we, we I'm didn't, very actually, sensitive eh, about this I time. understand. Um <laughs> If you were to chart the future, you would say robots would have a much bigger role in our future than we are presenting. Um, but that was the tone thing. So we most of our robots are there as utility robots, and there are some combat ones as well as enemies. This game of there a little bit. How much of reality, like the work of SpaceX, is an, an inspiration for the decisions made in this game? I wouldn't say it's for the decisions we made, but you know, visiting SpaceX and walking in there, it was it's like the Avengers meet NASA. <laughs> it's like the most amazing. And here we're building. <laughs> lot and so whenever i look at those kind of things or you know you'll visit the space shuttle sort of overcome with how big it is and i go stand back by the engines and think about that thing leaving orbit you know and one of the things that elon really impressed is like we're reaching the edge of physics on a lot of the stuff where how hard it is to leave orbit the gravitational pull like, so the engineering that has gone into that, our space program, what what he's doing now, um, I just marvel at. I don't understand, right? I'm not at that level, but I marvel at the... Some friends, hey, does everybody see this? What is that? And we just stood dumbfounded looking at this thing in the sky. And... Like, that is a UFO. Nobody takes their phone out. Do you ever think about the fact that science fiction seems to make, uh, it has a way of creating reality, not just kind of predicting it or imagining it? It's almost like the thing you put out there with a video game like this like Starfield, that you kind of anticipate it it kind of uh, fuels people's imagination of what is possible. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know, I can't, I can't say. You're making me think now about other science fiction that, movie I love, Minority Report, it's mm-hmm. more of like a, not a space movie, but more like looking at the future. Mm-hmm. If you look at a lot of the things in that movie, it's almost like, I think those are coming true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, is, is that the one that you do interface this? Like, um... It's the interfaces and then the, you know, the way he looks at his child is more like a holographic, almost AR, VR kind of thing, or digital billboards, or trying to predict human behavior. Um, there's a, that, there's just a lot of future stuff in that movie. As it comes to sci-fi, to your other question, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Well, I, I think it does. I think it's interesting. I mean, I suppose you're trying to create the most realistic, sticking to the tone, the most immersive, realistic world, and mo- almost by accident you create the thing that is possible because you want it to be realistic in some deep sense. So accidentally can become the pop. Look up on the stars, then we can actually travel out there. 
I don't know. There's power to sci-fi to do that. Mm -hmm. I guess you you shouldn't feel the pressure of that. <laughs> I don't know if I'd make the leap now. That's all. That what we're doing might now maybe you know one of our you know hopefully it might inspire some young people who are headed in that direction. Are like, oh, I thought about getting into space and space exploration and being an engineer or doing these things and I played this game and goes and does some of these things. Yeah, because in the next couple of decades likely a human being will step foot on Mars, which are the first steps towards us becoming multi uh, planetary. And then if you read some of the stuff they're doing uh with the James Webb telescope and them being able to look for signs of life on other planets is quite fascinating. And our lifetimes that we discover life on another planet. Yeah, especially if it's intelligent life. I've been talking to a lot of biologists and a lot of folks. I imagine there's life everywhere out there. It, the numbers are would say so, yes. The challenging question is what it looks like and how much of it is intelligent. So a lot of biologists tell me the big the big difficult leap is from the prokaryotes to the eukaryotes. So like the the complex life. It could be that a lot of our universe is just filled with bacteria. Well, I believe if if I'm understanding it right that there's two ways they're going to look at planets when they can look at you know they can read hey the, this planet has this kind of gas. Mm -hmm. They can now look at the ones that are created by potential life forms and then the ones that are created, the byproducts of industry. Mm -hmm. so there's only certain ones that are created if you have a society there. Um, and that they can start looking on these types of, in these types of star systems and these planets. But it in theory, given enough time, given the amount of space out there, um, we would find one. That would be a cool thing in this short life of ours to find out definitively that there is an, an, an industrial intelligent civilization out there. Before you contact them, so like die, end your life, <laughs> <laughs> not knowing the rest of this. Both are super exciting. If we're alone, it's super exciting because there's a responsibility to preserve whatever special thing we have going on here. This, um, whether you call it the flame of consciousness or whether it's consciousness or intelligence, that's the special thing. Preserve it, have it expand. But if there's others out there, I mean, that like that sparks that drive for ex exploration of reaching out into the stars and meeting them. Most of them probably want to kill us. <laughs> <laughs> so, but luckily we have the military industrial complex on Earth that builds be bigger and better weapons all we the have time. Space Force. Space Force. Right. It will both protect us and destroy all our enemies. <laughs> In the universe where you didn't blink, uh, what would that, Todd, tell me about the year it's coming out? Would it be 2025? That's a trick question. Or 26? I've been asked that question yeah. many ways, but never like... Um, I it's deeply love it. We we all do. It's a part of us. And you know, when you aren't doing it for a while, you you really do miss it. Um, and when I look at what we're doing, uh, have planned for that game. I, mean, I was in a meeting yesterday. I was like, I... so we don't see it slowing down. Yeah. And people will probably be playing it 10 years from now also. So you have to think about, okay, people are going to play the next Elder Scrolls game for a decade, two decades. And that does change the way you think about how you architect it from, from the get-go. 
What What are some elements that changed the way, like how do you make a game that's playable for 20 years? So well, I, we're trying to figure that out, but there, <laughs> <laughs> but there are some elements I should pause on that. You know, part of me, I'm of course asking jokingly, I'm excited for it, but I think Skyrim is an amazing game still. You know, I really enjoy it still. Yeah, and you know what? The content, the um, even if I think if you step away from it for a while, then play what I'll put, say, the vanilla version without mods. If you go and haven't played it in a while, there's always a new way to play it. But then if you look at the mods and what creators are doing to it, we think that is just awesome. Mm -hmm. It's something that we've always supported. We're going to keep supporting. We've hired a large number of modders that are now professionals. We want to support the people who are doing on their own so they can be professionals on their own. Um. Okay, a modder, a content creator is going to have to do it, use our tools. Now we do clean them up for release, you know, because you, if you're like a developer in house, you can deal with some kludginess. Mm -hmm. when you're putting stuff together. When you put it out for people, we do clean a lot of it up. And there's still a lot, of, obviously, a learning curve there. Um, but we have, look, we have people who have been doing it for 20 years with us. Um, What's involved with modding? I'm actually quite noobish at this. Okay. And so I'm you... almost afraid to ask, because now <laughs> that you explain to me, I'll, I, I fear I will spend a very large amount of time creating mods. Well, we have an editor uh, you can download it on Steam, the creation kit for our games, and then it loads up the world and you could do something really, really small, like change the color of the weather. And it creates a little plugin file, we call it, you know, a modification to the game. And then you can run your game with that. Um, it's on console now, the, the mods, not the editing. And it's just been incredible. Our community there has been amazing what they do with the games. So a lot of it is the, the the visuals. A lot of people do visual things because it's the easiest thing to do first or they'll build a new space. There's some great things with like, I love the Khajiit uh, follower mod for Skyrim. It's awesome. Um, the uh, There have been quest lines. Those things just take a really, really long time. And so someone is going to do that that's almost like it takes them a long time. It's more than a hobby. And we're always looking at ways that we can make it like, hey, they can turn a career into it because mm -hmm. it's just awesome. What about, is, is there any possibility in doing a mod for the some of the AI stuff? There is. And I've seen some, but to really move it along, if they're using the tools that we already put out there, so to really move the AI along, you'd have to get in the code, mm -hmm. which some people have figured out ways to hack in and do things with script extenders. But for the most part, like really pushing it, it does take us, which is why you see when we have a new game come along, the palette that they have is there's there's so many more things they can do. Well, I've I've built bots that play um, the the driving games, but they do that by just taking um, reading the screen and doing basic, not basic. It's actually pretty complicated, but computer vision doing the control. But you're basically simulating the human player um, to do that for Skyrim or for one, some of the open world games. That's literally you have to create AGI to be able to yep to play the. Those open. Well, maybe not. Maybe you can create a super dumb, like just a two handed sword and just keep swinging until there, everybody's they, dead. Look, there's some bot stuff out there that does it. We have we have some very very dumb bots that we use to run through the world to test it. Wow. That we'll deploy on a whole bunch of servers just to you know we do it every day. We run through every space. We're doing Starfield. <laughs> and runs around a little bit and then loads the next place and runs around a little bit. We're just testing, like, did it crash? What's the memory growth? What's the, get a report, here are all the places where the frame rate wasn't up to snuff. And then we do have one that will play on its own. It's heavily scripted, but it lets us test, you know, every time we make a build, there's a bot that runs through like the first one or two main quests. Like it'll just play it. That way we know, do we break anything? 
because you don't want to waste like QA's time. Like you guys broke it again within yeah. five minutes. So yeah, yeah. So that's for bot. That's for like uh, broken stuff. Right. I wonder if you can build a bot that estimates the quality of the experience. Oh my gosh. Okay. Can you do that? <laughs> no, I don't know. But just like the number, like how boring or not boring. The boring meter. How many times you die? How many times you die? Death is death. Boring. <laughs> death against yeah we always we have this chart at work we use which is like if you think about any game that you've played that you've put down it's either about a frustration slash confusion or boredom yeah you got to put the player right in the middle of that but i've sometimes put down games from frustration only to return (laughs) again stronger dark souls yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I mean, there that that's I mean the challenge. That's part of it. It's well, I don't know. Actually, Skyrim. I don't. I'm one of those. I mean, I'm sure there's all kinds of humans that you've interacted with about what they enjoy. But to me, I could enjoy S- Skyrim on every. Systems that make it, you know, in our minds, a more believable. Um, and it was actually a, a creation club thing made by an external creator who uh, is now full time with us. So, can we actually thinking about uh, Starfield, thinking about Elder Scrolls Six, go through the full life of a video game you've created? So, what's it take to take a game from the idea to find the final product? What are the different steps along the way? Great question. Um, Well, usually it starts with, I mean, honestly, lunchtime conversations with a number of us. Hey, we we think we want to do this. This is what it's going to be like. I mean, look, with an Elder Scrolls, you know you're going to do it. It's a matter of when. You say, okay, what's the tone we're going for, right? Where is it set? So we usually start with the world. game worked out like i like to think about okay how's the game start what's Mm -hmm. the player do first um we do music early you know so take elder school six we forgot where it's set what's the tone what are the big features we discuss the beginning of the game which we've had for a very long time where's it set again um yep (laughs) uh in tamriel and uh damn it well, at least we know we narrowed it down that. Yeah. That, that would be epic if it was like <laughs> a portal into another dimension. Anyway. Then I like to do music. So we've already done a take on the music uh, for Elder Scrolls Six. So you can sit there with the with like the, the concept art and the music and the you music. can feel yeah. it. No, no, the music. Turn that into a larger chunk when more of the team comes on, when the other game is done. Um, and that's still what we call a VS vertical slice. So you still don't have the full team on it. And it's a larger chunk of the game that you can play. And then once you feel good about that, you're going to bring on the rest of the team. And we're fortunate that the other games we've done are popular enough that we can be doing DLC and content and those kind of things while we're getting the one going. And then we're at full production where we're sort of at maximum size we just call that production. That's like the full production period. Um, and that, depending on the game, you know, can run a year, two years, uh, maybe more. And then you kind of have a finalizing final six months to a year on a game, which is, okay, we've built everything now. Um, and usually it needs a lot of glue where we have a lot of, very different elements that maybe aren't clicking together the way you want outside of the regular polish for levels and features. And we're shaving and gluing and sticking things together so that it's not the schizophrenic game experience that things flow from one into another. In terms of... says, welcome, do this, go here, check this out. And the skill system and the way it reacts on the HUD the interface of the game is sort of 
leading you to the next thing. Mm-hmm. In a, and once you get that flow down and the 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 rate at which the game is giving you activities, then you're in like what we we describe as a game flow. What is and it, it's not till really that last year. Before that, the game flow was just it's not it doesn't even exist mm-hmm. in the way that you see it in the final game. And that's what we were working on a lot that last year. So at which point is like the set of skills, the skill tree, the characteristics of the role playing aspect mm-hmm. of it? When is that set? The ideas? We usually that. have it in the beginning, but it's just we know it won't be done until that last year. We'll have one, but we know it's going to get honed because it's not until you really see okay, how impactful is that one? How much are you doing it? Like, how much are you really... And the main combat ones, they always win. You always know the players will drift toward the combat type skills because every character needs some amount of that. But okay, well, how how important is cooking? How important is alchemy? How important is these other type of activities? And then how do you balance them where when you load up the skill menu, it isn't automatically give me plus 10 damage. How do you get the, what about the combat system? That does seem to be an important part of a lot of games. Even- Start in the beginning, yeah, every time. Yep. So usually when we're making that first playable, it's an area you can go through, some amount of dialogue, some amount of combat. How do you get the combat right? What What's the secret to a great combat system? Well, first on a control side, helping the player when they don't realize it. There's a lot of tricks you can do with magnetism in terms of the controller and where the attacks go. So it has to feel, the minute to minute has to feel really good in your hand. So there's a lot of animation time, right? And changing animation so they're impactful and they they happen at a rate that the player feels like they're really doing it. Mm-hmm. And then ultimately, it's the illusion that the enemies are smart, but they really are there for you to kill them, (laughs) right? So they do a lot of things to just let themselves get killed. They're not as near as smart, near as smart as we can make them because it turns out that is not fun. Right. (laughs) So there's a balance between, but there's a, that is, I guess, a, a kind of AI and it's a very intimate interaction with an AI. Because it's like there's a lot of stuff going on. It's not just very kind of shallow, like a dialogue or something like that. It's like there's a time critical nature of it. A lot of stuff is happening, and if ever if anything feels off, it's it's going to feel wrong. Yep, all the games do. A, a multiple enemy scenario is really. You know, they don't all shoot you. They trade off. They're going to wait. And I was like, all right, I'll just wait my turn because we don't want to overwhelm them. But he feels like you feel like you're overwhelmed when there's six enemies. But, you know, a good game will, no, they're going to they're gonna take their time. Is there a science to it? Is it is it art? Is it like, <laughs> like how do yes, you? Yes, yes. I mean, it's yeah. it's. It's all of that. So it's like an iterative process where you try different things. You have different yep. ideas. There's a lot of there's a lot of animation. There's a lot of timing, design. animation work, HUD work. Also, how does the reticule change? Uh, does, you know, a lot of games don't have that kind of thing. So what role yeah, does yeah. that play? In, you know, uh, I think we the we really cracked it. Uh, in a way I liked with Fallout 4, actually, where when we're doing Elder Scrolls, we have like the flowers and things and you have alchemy. And we took this to, okay, if it's post-apocalyptic, what if everything in the world was an alchemical ingredient in some kind? So breaking it down to their components. So when you walk around a world like that, again, we like the simulation. We like we like the forks and the spoons and the cups and all that. Okay, how can I use those to create? So I, I love how it works, starts working in Fallout 4, where, okay, all these things I find, there is they have some value in creating or crafting outside of a cup is worth 
one gold piece or one cap. By the way, I have to be honest, I haven't played Fallout 4. I played Fallout 3. I thought that was a legendary game. I've been, uh, um, can you make a case for Fallout 4 that I should, or should I just wait till Fallout 5? And when does that come I think you should play Fallout 4. Love to hear your thoughts. All right. It's a different game. Skyrim is too. I mean, it's, uh, we, we try to make them all different. They all, they they, all have, they are fundamentally different. They all have their own tone. tone. Yeah. Yeah. So Fallout 3 and Fallout 4 intentionally a very different tone. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. So what, what what's that world like? What's uh, the post-apocalyptic world of Fallout? If you can just briefly take a stroll into that world, tone-wise. Well, there's, look, in entertainment, there's a lot of post-apocalyptic stuff. And what what makes Fallout tick is the the world that was left behind, the world that blew itself up, this utopian world of nuclear energy and it all goes wrong. So I love the American dream of that, like how they visioned the future in the 50s and that blowing itself up. I think that's like a super interesting place to explore, which is why we always wanted to play in that world. Um, And it does an amazing job of sort of weaving you know, the drama and darkness of a post-apocalyptic world with B-movie humor. Um, you know, it winks at the camera. Outside of anything else kind of in that genre. So Elder Scrolls has, or at least Skyrim has some humor. Uh, you've said that, quote, when we started Fallout 3 in 2004, we obviously had big ideas of what we could do with it, and I talked to a lot of people, from ex-developers to press folks to fans. What made it special? What are the key things you'd want out in, in a new one? The opinions, and I'll put this mildly, varied a lot, but they would all end the same, like a stern father pausing for effect, but do not screw it up. How do you not screw up a game? You have not screwed up many games yet. I mean, back to the Fallout one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was, look, That I remember that. We were met with a lot of skepticism in terms of, oh, what are they going to do with this? It was a beloved kind of isometric, turn-based role-playing game. You know, awesome for when it came out. a company i don't remember um i just remember we had to announce it and we're thinking there well you're gonna we're gonna piss off all the elder scrolls fans because we're announcing a fallout game we're probably gonna piss off the hardcore fallout fans because we didn't make the original and clearly we'll probably make a different kind of game so i do remember you know there was a, a lot of concern with with all of our fans um and fans of fallout at the time and so I think it was pretty rewarding for us that that game found the audience and success that it that it did. Um, it's one of my favorite projects that I've ever ever worked on, and because it was so fresh for us, and we we had a very clear like even before we had the rights, like this is the game we're going to make, like we're this is the kind of thing we're going to do, and we had done more when then we were working on Oblivion. And it was kind of a breath of fresh air to do it. And what's kind of remarkable is Fallout 3 comes out just, you know, two and a half years after Oblivion. And we did all this DLC for Oblivion. So we were really, really kind of prolific in how our development, how it was going. And so um, I just remember enjoying making that game so much because it was everything we were doing was new. Which which asked of the world creation, uh, was there some innovation like technically that was happening? The too? world creation, you know, like it was, you know, obviously a different look, even though some of us, a very few of us had worked on the Terminator things. Um, the VAT system, the skill system, and we loved the original game so much. So you felt this responsibility to bring it yeah. back in a big way and reintroduce it in a way that, you know, as much as we could scratch the same itch 
when you when you played the or, original game that it had the same tone. Are there some favorite things to you about that world that just kind of connect you to the humor? Fallout 3, I love, again, I usually start with the beginning. I love the beginning. I love the character generation. If you go, if you played it a lot or you're developing it, it starts to feel really long. Mm -hmm. But the first time you play it or second, I just think it's awesome. And this idea, it's a hard thing to say, okay, we want we want you to feel like your character on the screen. Even when you play like a Skyrim, you don't know what you were doing before that. But Fallout 3, you you were born in the vault and you raised in the vault and you lived in the vault, but you experience a part of that. So it's a very different when you step out, it I think it really I mean, the visuals are the visuals, but the emotional moment of stepping out of the vault, you feel like you lived your whole life in the vault. The, and you feel like you have a sense of your past. Right. Like, and the, I need to find my father. We, sh we should, isn't it possible to have that sense with like Elder Scrolls, like a life story, like, like childhood trauma and stuff? <laughs> Back to the human condition. I mean, you'd have to like, I'll, we look, you do some of that stuff, but they go through menus. You know, pick your background. We're doing that in Starfield. Hey, pick your background. What were you doing before this moment? Can you uh, pick your traumas and stuff? Like, <laughs> <laughs> say, that's hey, a mod. If you that's want to a make mod. a mod, you want yeah, to make a mod. You. You go, yeah, thank you. Go for that. And then also make a mod for like a therapist. But a lot of it, you know, is in your head. So you're going to you're gonna do that. You're going to pick this background. You do these things and you're sort of like, this is who I was. Yeah. And we intentionally with Elder Scrolls kind of make it a as much of a blank slate you know, Elder Scrolls is a little bit more of a blank slate game to who you are, um, which has a, a lot of positives. And and Fallout for us has been more of a this is this this was your life before. Here's who you were. Go. Uh, speaking of childhood trauma, but I <laughs> but I, I but I feel like there's a lot of. A lot of the meaningful experience of a role-playing game is not just the development of the character throughout the game, but the initial character creation, like you said. Is there something to that process that um, you found to be powerful? Like the design of that process, because you think so much about that beginning. What? How much should be controlled? How much should be defined? The interface itself? The visual appearance of the character too, because mm -hmm. I feel like that you're loading in, you start to load in the world that you're about to enter by creating that character, right? Yeah, we think about it a lot. It's a really, really good uh, comment and question, and it's more than it has to set the whole stage. It has to like pique your interest for the. <laughs> that can be undone or not undone. Because what you, what game players want to is I'll play it and then I'll, I'll make a new character. But sometimes they do that because they realize they made the wrong type of character. And as a designer, you don't want that to happen. So some people, when you get this comment in Elder Scrolls, like, oh, you simplified it. Like, no, 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 no. We move those choices into the gameplay. So, horrible mistake and so okay i'm going to start out like that to me is a really really bad experience so also like life itself but yes go ahead <laughs> but like life is okay so you can then fix it in game <laughs> right i wish i wish i had learned archery yeah. well i'm going to start tomorrow yeah um so you can do that like the skyrim character system uh, you know, it was really designed around that. All you pick is like, what's your race? And that gives you some things, but there's nothing you can't get then on your own. It mostly change in the game and some starting skills that get you off to the type of play that you want. But if you discover you don't like that type of play, mm -hmm. as you play, you can move your character. 
scroll six, you're already thinking mm-hmm. about that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. So yeah. you think of early on the, 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 like you said, the first few experiences in the game, you're already thinking through them. Yeah. Yeah. We, we know what the first few hours are like. We, we know what the character system is basically like. And so tonally, what's the difference to you between Oblivion, Skyrim, Morrowind, Oblivion, Skyrim, and uh, Elder Scrolls Six. Like, I, I could to me, I've, man, stuff blends together. Yeah. Uh, but Oblivion, that's when you could make spells and stuff. You could, think. you could do it in Morrowind as well. Oblivion has some more guardrails on it. Morrowind's where you can really go, and Daggerfall. And uh, can you do it in, I don't remember if you can make spells in Arena. I think you can. Someone will correct me. You definitely can in Daggerfall. It gets yeah. crazy. Morrowind, um, you can somewhat. And then we start we start putting guardrails on it because yeah. people started breaking the game in certain ways. Yeah. Why is it about to break the game? Like you always want it <laughs> to be. Well, there's like one people love in Morrowind where you could make these uh, recall stones and uh, you could teleport. Uh-huh. to different areas which you really need oh, in that game it yeah. breaks so many quests yeah and so as we any any quest we were then we would do this this exercise of designing a quest and then someone would say and then i re- make better content so uh a tangent upon a tangent upon a tangent how do you create a, a compelling quest because there's all kinds of personalities of humans that play these games, right? Because I like the grind. Well, there's look, <laughs> like, there's there's multiple flavors of a compelling quest. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, some of them have very good upfront storytelling. You just like the- be just as rewarding as the really handcrafted, well done little bit more linear with an interesting choice at the end if those objects are in the world in some you know believable way that there's usually some challenge at getting getting them how do you place objects in a world in an interesting way because it's a big oh, part are we this- have a level design you cannot people oh if they only knew how much we spend on we have a clutter group a group of people who clutter like we like what's, what's clutter, clutter is all the stuff around just so like interior decorators yeah for treasure and stuff and trash and um they go through every space and they clutter it mm-hmm. our level designers think about it a lot these also become landmarks for the player when you're walking through a space and oh this is the place with this and there is a logic to making a good level um as they say with even if you walk by like a little t intersection that becomes like a decision point in the player's head like oh i didn't go down that way but the more you do that it looks easy on paper but when you're playing a game you actually kind of want to limit those because he's trying to keep track of all these decision points then they get lost and yes we have maps but anytime the player's going to check a map in a place like that i feel that it's more of like a backstop mm-hmm. for certain players. If we, if they need to check the map, feel like we've kind of failed. Got it. So it's just, there's a there's a momentum to it. it just pulls pulls them in. It and you know, feel look, like you played required. a lot of games. You played a lot of levels where you're just like, I'm a little confused, or I don't know. And yeah. then you play other levels where, like, man, I just, I, yeah, I, it was great. I went through it. It was well balanced. I knew where I was going. And it's not, you don't want to ever be mazy as long as you wish we got better at it. It would save us a lot of time. But you're constantly going by feel like this is not, this is too much, this is not enough. Right, right. Because the other thing is, look, it creates, um, people want to pick everything up. They want to click everything. So if you have too many things of importance in a room, it's like, it, it actually makes you feel a little tight. As a player, you're like, well, I need, I'm basically an idiot if I don't pick all this stuff up. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. probably felt this way. Yeah, 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 for sure. And like the moment where you decide that you're just like, I've clicked so many things in this room, I actually am going to leave 
that ammo canister there. Yeah. But you feel like a dope. Yeah. You've probably experienced this. Yes. Okay. But, but so, also you have a you have a joy from if there's not many items and you found the one and you got it. Right. And you feel good. I got it. And then it's finding like, oh, I stuck my head in this corner and, you know, I picked this lock and I opened this locker and, oh, there was this, there was this thing I've been waiting for. Yeah. What about like rare and rare items? That's an art, even more so of an art. Um, I will say we have a ways to go there in terms of finding the right drop rate for special items, we call them, you know, your epic, rare, legendary. You look at games, like so many games do it, and there are ones that Pete, you just play and love because they have it down. De you know, Destiny, Destiny 2 is great at it. Diablo, a series I love, you know, sort of famously, Diablo 3, which I think is great. And they did an update. It mostly just changed the loot drops. And it's like this whole new experience. And there's a real, real art to it. Um, I think that that we're still learning. We're still learning a lot and have to, uh, we're trying to, you know, get better at it because it's one of those things where it drives you through the game. It's it's fun to get the treasure. And Diablo and Skyrim have this interesting quality of being extremely popular. And there's a lore around like rare items. So mm -hmm. it's a, it changes the dynamic of like, you could afford to have really rare items. Yes. And then, <laughs> and then somebody finds it and that becomes like a thing. I mean, as you release a game, there's a, there's a, I mean, a lot of people play it and they start sharing stories and so on. It's so interesting because that's part of the game experience is the stories of others, right? For us, a hundred percent. And then they say, did you know, <laughs> if you go here and do this, what did you know? And that to us uh, is where a lot of our community has, has been sharing their stories and here's what you can do. Has there ever been a temptation to create um, not a single player game? That's gigantic. That's well. We did Fallout seventy six. We have Elder Scrolls Online, not not a game I created, mm -hmm. but and look, that started as more classic MMO. Know the folks; they're part of our company who made that game, um, and it's insanely, insanely popular. It is okay, so I should try it out. They do some great storytelling quests. Like the actual mechanics aren't the same as Skyrim, but the world is awesome. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, I haven't played because uh, there's a there's a mobile uh, Fallout game, right? I need to play that. I, I was thinking of playing Diablo Mobile too. I mean, you can debate the monetization, but I would not. It's I think they did a fun. It's really fun on Fallout. What's, what's the, uh, Diablo? Oh, Diablo. Yeah, that. well, Fallout. I definitely recommend that one. <laughs> Fallout. A game for mobile versus the PC and console. Well, obviously the screen size, right? Is that what you feel first? What what what's the it, what's the fundamental change in the in the philosophy of design? Does it does it constrain? Does it change the tone of the game? Well, we've done a few things, and we have a new mobile game that we're working on that we haven't announced yet that I'm in love with. Um, there are a couple things that you ap approach on mobile now. days they can stare at their phone for hours that's all they do that's yeah. where they watch everything so it's also like a demographic thing the younger audience they would rather sit and stare at their phone than play it on a big screen i would just love to sort of list out throughout human history the evolution of sentences that began with if you look at kids these days <laughs> it's <laughs> true uh, it's true the kids the kids of the kids these days will probably be talking about be doing like virtual reality. Like I love kids. mobile games though. I, I play a ton of them. I am like the game, my favorite game this year is Marvel Snap, this card game from the folks who did Hearthstone. You should really play it. If you like, do you like I'm card games? Oh uh, yeah. Do you like, like superheroes? 
no. It's no. genius. You don't like superheroes? No, I don't like superheroes. I never understood. Listen, this never. This is gro- growing. Who doesn't like girl gro- Growing up in the Soviet Union, what I don't understand the this. Is, all right, well, I don't understand. You're wearing a costume. It's 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 silly to me. I can't. So you have to uh, suspend. Um, like you, you have to be able to immerse yourself, and for some reason, there's something about costumes. Costume. It doesn't get me. But then again, I'm like into elves and dragons, so I don't understand. And I'm fine. I think I get it. Yeah, but the rest, the rest, at least the America, the Western world disagrees with me. So, uh, even Batman, you have like little ears, but all right, that's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, well, back to uh, Elder Scrolls Starfield. So, one thing I didn't ask you about when you look at the timeline of five, six, seven, eight years, whatever it is, to create a game, what's the role of the deadline internally, not publicly? It keeps you honest. Do you try to keep in your own brain a deadline for the mm-hmm. team a mm-hmm. deadline? Yeah, all the time. And when you set that deadline early in the development, do you try to set deadline like that's really tough to reach? No, we try to make it like, hey, this is our best guess. If you make it tough to reach, it's sort of, you know, you're going to miss it. It's arbitrary. We really try to, you know, keep ourselves honest because it, it will let you know where you're at, right? When I have first playable, we want to be done with prototyping or design by this date. We want to have first playable this date. We want to have this. But... Look, you know, things happen. Pandemic happens. People go home. It mm-hmm. throws everything off. Or, you know, what you needed to do, because we're not just like making a game and then moving everybody on, you know, what you needed to do. Like Skyrim was so popular, we kept people on that game for longer. Does it get super stressful as you get closer? Are you, you try to avoid announcing anything? Is there a temptation to announce? That? Well, I've done it all ways, right? I've I've announced, you know, Starfield. We're pretty, you know, loud with a, a release date that we then had to delay. So, um, was that tough? It was, it was, but it was the right thing to do. And uh, how how do you know it's the right thing? To, like when you when you sat down and looked at it, like this is not ready. <laughs> and publishing and you know we've reached a point where on starfield where it was it was pretty clear to us even though you want to say you can get it done that the risk involved with that to the to the fans of the game to the team to the company we're part of xbox now to everybody was we should really uh we should really move it and give it the time it needs so you mentioned part of Xbox. I think written about it. What's what what are the what are the exciting aspects of that? You know, when your company goes through a change like that, no matter what it is, even if it's somebody that you've worked with for a long time, you never know what you're in for. You hope. Um and I had worked with them uh, for since we started doing console stuff with Morrowind was, you know, they came to us, came to me and said, hey, you should make this game for the Xbox. And so when they were making that console, um, had a great experience with them. And then on the 360 with Oblivion. And so I guess the point is, we felt that we had a very good relationship. Um, Phil Spencer on down has been, you know, feel really, really lucky. And then a game like Starfield, where, look, we've had a lot of success with with the games that you talked about, but we've never been kind of... You know, there is a lot of pressure there. There's a lot of responsibility there to make sure we deliver for everybody. Is there a chance that Starfield is exclusive to Xbox? It is It is exclusive. It's officially Xbox, already... PC. Yep, yes. So you're, <laughs> I get it. So extra pressure also creating a new world. Yeah, it's new, but keep in mind, for us, that exclusivity is not unique, even though we've done PlayStation stuff. And I think 
developers in the beginning. We transitioned to Xbox, became our lead platform. Like Morrowind's basically exclusive to Xbox. Oblivion was exclusive to Xbox for a long period of time. Skyrim DLC was exclusive. So we've done a lot of like our initial stuff is all Xbox. So we get into development and saying we're focused on Xbox and it's not abnormal for us in any way. It's been kind of the norm. And from a development side, I, you know, I like the ability to focus. So our ability to focus and say, and have help from them, you know, the top engineers at Xbox to say, we are going to make this look incredible on the new systems is like, from from my standpoint, it's just awesome. What's the difference in creating the, the console versus the PC? I also have to admit, I've never... Um, is this shameful? Actually, you should recommend to me. I've never played Skyrim or any uh, any of the games you've created on Xbox. Really? Yeah, and on console, I I played. I mean, I've played very little Xbox. Yeah, sure. But. I mean, look, there's ob- there's the obvious interface part yeah. between mouse and keyboard, and then a controller. But when you're looking at hardware, PCs, it's tough, yeah. right? Because you're looking at well. You know, what are their driver versions? You know, what kind of monitor do they have? What is the actual refresh rate of X, Y, and Z? Um, we're used to it. Yeah. But if, you know, anyone will tell you, give me the hardware that I know I'm writing it for. You know this. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the Series X is just a incredible machine. And... Now and that you know what it is, you know you know what, what it is, and and now that we're part of Xbox, getting you know the people who built it to show you how to make it really, really dance. Now that you you can kind of cross, you can take your save and go between, and all those things. You can, yeah. If you depends on if for which games, so for the Skyrim, if you have the. Game Pass PC version of it versus Got Steam, it. not not via Steam right now, not Got via it. Steam. Got it. And so there's the Game Pass. So I'm, I'm like learning about this. So there's a Microsoft Game. So this is gonna be on Game Pass, and then you can if yeah if you can take it from PC through Game Pass. But I think it depends on like, like for me, like what's my physical mood? Do I want to lean right. back on a sofa? Exactly. Right. Size like my the actual too. physicality of it yeah. is what determines where I want to play. Yeah. Do I want to be two feet from a thing right now? And sometimes I like that. I am more of a console player just because I sit on my PC at work all day. Like I play a lot of video games. So when I get home and I want to play something else, like I am a sofa screen controller person. Let me ask you a ridiculous question. So you've created some of the greatest games ever. I, I think there's... There's uh the question would be what's the best game of all time? All right, all right, just give me a second. So, Tetris. All right, yeah, that's interesting. Have you read the book on Tetris? No. You should read it, particularly for someone who grew up in Russia. Yep. But I think I would put personally, I would put Skyrim. I'll take that. Good answer. At number one for me, uh, which is. It's tough, however you put it, because you could also make the case out of the uh, Elder Scrolls series, like, what do you actually value more? If you put Tetris and Super Mario up there, then, like, the credit goes to Morrowind, maybe, over Skyrim. I don't I don't know where the biggest leaps are, um, but overall, I think it's Skyrim. But uh, for you, if you're not allowed to pick any of the games you were involved with, what are some interesting candidates for you that are just games that inspired the world, impacted the world, shook the world in terms of what video games are able to do? Well, first, I'm just sort of like hearing you say that you think Skyrim is the best game of all time is quite like, thank you. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, incredible thing to hear. Um, And, you know, when I think about... We have a couple of answers. There's ones that are like personal to me. Ultima Seven is probably. Yeah, can mine. you talk about Ultima? Like you, you said that as an inspiration. I've, I've never I crossed that world. Well, 
played Ultimas and plays our stuff can see the kind of uh, touchstones and callbacks to that or inspirations. And um, the other thing that I loved about Ultima... Thing. Oh, when you, bu- when you buy it... When you buy, you know, the cardboard boxes and the way they were designed and Ultima 7 is black and Ultima 8 is the fiery gate and the paintings on them. And I just, you know... If Does you that look, break your heart a little bit that that culture is a, is a big gone? A little bit. A little bit. And that's also why I like, you know, this goes to video games. Games. And we spend a lot of time in them so that, you know, take a look at Elder Scrolls and Morrowind Oblivion and Skyrim. We want those boxes to look good next to each other. Going back to the video games, you know, I always mention Tetris because I think it's, you know, obviously I love virtual worlds and those kind of things, but for the time and what an interactive like video game, sort of the simplest form, I sort of think you can put Tetris in front of just about anybody and they'll enjoy it. And it's got some moment of challenge and um, it's just so elegant. It's like, to me, the like this very pure game that only works because it's a video game. And I think mobile games figured out some of the magic of Tetris, the simple. Uh, some of them have, yeah, yeah. And yeah. but Tetris did it a long, long time ago. Right. You you can I'm, really create that immersive experience without. But uh, for me, you know, the Ultima Civilization. Yeah. Um, as far as you know, a grand strategy game. Um, Pac-Man I mentioned in terms of bringing games into the mainstream in a way that captured people that nothing before it had. Super Mario, Donkey Kong, everything. Nintendo, I probably the best game makers in the world still. Um, so. They know who they are. They know what they want to do. Um, always in awe of what they create. I got to ask you about the... Uh a game i haven't played but people put up there as one of the greats is zelda breath of the wild have you gotten a chance to play it? a lot of it's it a... yes yes it's fantastic it's fantastic what do you think about i mean it's a very even though there was gta 1 and 2 this was an all new thing with the mobster storytelling uh is that Vi- the first Vice three D version, I guess. It was. It was then Vice City's kind of a fast follow, which uh, could be my favorite one. Um, so you, like- I loved all the Grand Theft Auto. I think they're really phenomenally well made games. Same with Red Dead. I think Red Dead Redemption One could be my favorite story. Like, so highly like- recommend finishing that game. So you like both the story, you, you like the grittiness of that, because they have they have a bit of the, like, I guess if you like the fall, fallout, there's the humor, the, I don't know, I don't know what it is, it's the lighthearted humor of it, but also the brutality uh, of human nature is in there too. But it's like, uh, and also some of the fun they create with the music when you drive and stuff like that. They, 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 create, they create a world, there's a tone. They do. There's a- Another weird creation. I could just sit here and list games forever. For well, I'm enjoying this. <laughs> Hearthstone's a game I love. I love all types, like sports, college football, NCAA football was my favorite. It's like I would say this is a great role. Oh, you game. would actually keep getting role. <laughs> it's a role playing game because well, I have all these characters. I have like you know yeah. sixty characters, and they're all leveling up, and then I have to play them. And then the college one, because I like college football, they graduate, so you lose your players, and then they stop making the series and. I know the folks at EA, and they will say, I have bugged them. When is this coming? And they're doing it, so it's finally coming back. Nice. What would you say is the is the, is the the greatest sports game of all time? Hmm. Well, it's NCAA football. You have to pick the year. That's it. Versus Madden? Oh, yeah. Yeah, but there's more teams. You got the college, you know, 
fight songs, there's more pageantry, and the players turn over. They're only there for four seasons. So you have to the 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 so you know, it's the there's it's more dynamic. So you like variety versus So what greatness. was the last one? Two thousand fourteen, maybe it was. And you don't like FIFA and I like look, FIFA's incredible. I just look, I'm a college football fan. <laughs> they, they give you that fantasy if you like if you like european football slash soccer fifa is incredible yeah, i love that game too have you been paying attention to the game design of that world of those worlds it's a really difficult task when people know how it should work then you're going to balance it for single player the multiplayer parts of it um they get very very competitive and, you know, in many respects, you're forced to put out a new version every year. And I say forced in quotes because they're, you know, you count them as big updates. Um, but it's a very, it's a much more difficult development process than I think um, people understand and how hard those teams work. I know a lot of people who do it and I think they just do. I've, I've enjoyed them all. I buy Madden every year. So uh, yeah, every single year, yeah, they do refresh it. There's a feeling of freshness. I don't know what that is. Yeah, look, there have been years where it feels like less was done and more was done, but I I enjoy it every year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what does a perfectly productive day in the life of Todd Howard look like? So uh, maybe not perfectly, but just like a perfectly average productive. Day. Uh, what what are you a morning person, evening person? Is it chaos? Is it pretty regular? Uh, I'm in a good I'm in a good flow right now. I'm still doing a lot of stuff, so there's things I'm like executive producing, and then you know Starfield I'm directing, so I sort of view that as that's an everyday thing. Um, fortunately, I get to do a lot of stuff from look at the TV show we're making and. Um, this Indiana Jones game that's being developed at Machine Games, so we get to look at that. Um, but it, you know, the best really day or where I feel it's fulfilling is um, get to play some of a game, the game, we'll say Starfield, get to play some of Starfield, look at w the problem set of what it is doing, and then get in a room with the other developers that I work closely with and we solve that problem together. So that's the most rewarding thing. The beginning, the pie in the sky part mm -hmm. is always fun, but it's like anything is possible. That's fun, but it's not rewarding in the same way because you haven't solved something. Whereas these are the elements you have to play with. Mm -hmm. How do we make this all work together? And you come out of it at the end of the day, like, now that feels great. So brainstorming about spe specific big picture, both big picture and, and very specific detail of a game that's not working, something's not working, you want to fix it, that kind of stuff. Because you, just... you feel like, okay, you've made tangible progress on the actual build of the game. Mm -hmm. Or something you played in the beginning of the day, didn't feel great. You've figured out a solution with a group of people. Like, it's always with a group. And then the next day, you're like, yeah, that was, that worked out. Who's on the team? Is it designers, engineers? All the above. Artists, voice over So in, in, internal to the studio, it's, you know, a lot of... and the skill systems yeah and then level design is making the spaces like those that you'll play through um, production is a big part of it the producers who organize everything um i can't remember if i mentioned art a lot of artists um qa staff as well creativity and art it's great and it's really the gaming you know the combination of that and like like I mentioned to you offline, I think of video games as I mean, to me has brought thousands of hours of happiness. And so when you're designing the game, whatever you're doing, you have a part to play in a thing that's going to bring like millions, 
hundreds of millions of hours of happiness to people. It's and you know, crazy, right? It is, and I'm gonna I'm gonna play play you saying that back to our team because you know people forget your head's down, you're trying to solve these problems, and then you do forget how many people it touches. Like even tiny decisions you make, yeah. tiny little things you create. Yeah, it's weird. I wish there was a way to like. Um, I would notice things in a video game, and it's like, huh. Okay, like the, the, the f- it feels good, but you don't ha- get that signal. It, the the creator doesn't get that signal. I wish they did. Um, I guess you could get that signal by, you know, why is Lex stuck in this room, like <laughs> digging through the loot? <laughs> we this- do get we do now get a lot of good data on what the players are doing, enjoying and not that. Kind well, of we we know where they've been and where they've died and how long they play in certain sections, and we can sort of tell outside of people just telling us on forums or calling or other things, Mm -hmm. um, we can tell for some data where people are dropping off or having a, you know, we can tell if there's a key frustration point. Do you ever think about making people feel like human feelings when they play? Like designing, like make them feel fear or excitement, anger? Uh, longing, loneliness with Starfield. All the above. Yeah, of course. The big one, I like to say, is the video games give you is pride hmm. outside of other, you know, if you watch movies or things like that, like, yeah, but you never think, like, look what I did. Yes, and sir. that feeling of, like, accomplishment and pride in what you did or you overcame, you talked about going back to a game that, for, like, those are real feelings of like accomplishment that I've felt in game. Feel that, um, it's really, really special. The other one is there is a, you know, there is an escape or to be someone else that's more powerful in what, in our games that, you aren't in real life that gives you a confidence or a perspective. Um, We're doing one next. And get old as quickly as possible. It's the hardest. (laughs) It's hard. And then video games allow you, I mean, to build that sense of confidence, a sense of pride in something. That's why when people talk uh, down to video games, like it's a culture and so on, it's, it's not, it misses out on that really deeply meaningful thing. Agreed. Especially with like single player, there's some darker aspects to multiplayer that people create communities and, you know, it can it can go off the rails a bit. But the actual experience of the game, um, especially one where you stick with for a while, that's, that's really beautiful. Um, do you have uh, advice for those same young folks? given that your life is an interesting one, <laughs> given what kind of degree you got and up being a legendary game designer, do you have advice for young folks in high school, maybe college? I don't know. And don't do it for money. Don't do it for, find something you love and uh, the rest of it will come. It won't be a straight path. And do not ever underestimate yourself. Because they love it so much that this is what they want to do. When you do it for other reasons, I just don't think it's going to work out the same. Did you have low points? Uh, in your life, dark points where your your mind went to a dark place, whether it's uh, struggling to get a job at uh, Bethesda Softworks or maybe w- with a um, Red Guard flop or uh, where you kind of start to doubt yourself or any of that. Well, I think what's weird looking back, I was so... I was always so like in love with doing this Mm -hmm. that I didn't view them as like dark per se. (laughs) 
<laughs> looking back, I was like, oh, that was, I just wanted to, okay, let me find a way to make this work. Mm -hmm. Even when it's hard and it's failing and all that kind of stuff, you just kind of like, it's a problem before you to solve. Yeah, you know, when I started at Bethesda, I don't know, my father had moved near nearby to the office. I work there. That's all I want to do. Um, when the company almost went out of business, it was, well, I hope it doesn't. <laughs> I feel somewhat responsible. <laughs> but hey, let's, okay, that's a learning lesson. Let's go. I think I was pretty resilient to it all. Fallout 76, like, really bad launch. And okay, what did we do wrong? What can we learn? Let's go at it. Now it's a, now it's a success. But those kind of ups and downs for the length of developments that we have, you know, people don't see them, but we have them, you know, all the time. And so it's that sort of belief that, you know, with the team having done it time and time again to know that now nah, we're going to, we're going to make it as good as we possibly can. And whatever we're experiencing now, when we solve it and we get it out and, you know, we see the millions of people who love it, it's all worth it. And you're getting into new spaces. First of all, new worlds with Starfield, but also new, I saw the TV show you're working on. Uh, yep. not, on Fallout with Amazon. This world, and mm -hmm. I always love the work he did uh, writing Interstellar and the dark, like movies I just love. Wait, Jonathan Nolan is involved with this? With yeah, he's Fallout? the... He, yeah, he's the he's the EP That's and epic. he's directed. This is the Lex Free Podcast.